Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, worship here at City Life Church. My name is Michael Johnson. I serve as one of the ruling elders here, and it is a pleasure to uh, welcome you in the name of our Savior Jesus. Welcome to those inside of our uh, immediate worship space. Uh, welcome those outside. Uh, welcome to those of you watching uh, wherever you may be uh, on your computer or phone as well. We're glad uh, that you're here. A few announcements. Um, and, and by the way, regarding announcements, we just do encourage you to look if you're particularly a, a member or a regular tender, uh, keep up to date with the, the City Life weekly email just to keep up to date on that. But three important things to draw to your attention before we uh, dig in this morning. And I guess first of all, as, as many of you know, we have significantly opened up uh, a lot of space uh, to accommodate people here at our church, uh, as I've already mentioned. And so I want to thank those who have volunteered and put in the time and the effort to make this happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, second, our session met for uh, a meeting last Monday, and we're slated, Lord willing, to, uh, or two, yes, last Monday, we're slated to meet not tomorrow, but the following Monday as well. Um, and stay tuned for a session update uh, that should be going out tomorrow. And then lastly, uh, officer nominations. Uh, as many of you know, and thank you for those of you that have already submitted uh, those online. We do appreciate it. We are reading them. We're uh, kept up to date on those as well. Uh, we are going to extend that deadline just by two weeks. We're not delaying the process, so to speak, uh, but we do want to get some more uh, pertinent information to you about the process and about what we have in mind uh, regarding officer nominations. And again, we'll provide more of that information uh, tomorrow uh, in a session update. So those are the three things. And let's now turn to the Lord in prayer. Psalm 105 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let us pray. O oh, Father most high, whose dwelling place is beyond the heavens. O oh, Lord incomparable, far beyond our loftiest thoughts. Gather us together in the name of Jesus, whom the angels adore as the Son of the Most High, for his name is above every name. Lead us now in our worship, that all we do might be undertaken at your bidding, filled with your grace, directed by your wisdom, informed by your truth, and accomplished to your glory. Through Christ our Lord, whom with you and the Holy Spirit, O Father, we constantly bless and glorify. One eternal God, age after age. Amen. Our call to worship is indeed from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 7. Hear now God's call for us to enter into that. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. His miracles and the judgments he uttered. O oh, offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God, and his judgments are in all the earth. Please stand now as we sing together. Uh, if you're at home, I invite you, if you're able to stand and sing as well. And we want to remind you, uh, for those of us, particularly in this immediate space, uh, our singing, we're just keeping it not full-throated, but a little more subdued, uh, under your breath, so to speak. But please stand and let's sing.
now turn our attention to a time of confession of sin. Not a very popular thing to do uh, in our culture, uh, even in our churches, to admit not only uh, that we do wrong, but that we are wrong and that we sin. We are, to the core, uh, rebels by what we do and what we have left undone. Our words for reflection and preparation come from Psalm 130, verses 1 through 4. And as I read this and as you follow along, note a couple of things. First, note the desperation of this plea. And secondly, note the promise in that last verse. But now let's direct our attention again to these words from Psalm 130, verses 1 through 4. And after I read this, uh, I would ask that we will pause for roughly a minute to use those words to reflect upon. You can look ahead to that corporate confession as well and linger over it. So uh, you can not be, we're not all surprised by it. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And then here's the promise. But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Let's pause silently now to confess our sin to the Lord. And let's now confess together. Our Father in heaven, we confess that we do not live up to the family name. We are more ready to resent than to forgive, more ready to manipulate than to serve, more ready to fear than to love, more ready to keep our distance than to welcome, more ready to compete than to help. At the root of this behavior is mistrust. We do not love one another as we should because we do not believe that you love us as you do. Forgive us our cold unbelief and make more vivid to us the meaning and depth of your love revealed at the cross. Give us joy and rest in the work of your son who made us your sons and daughters. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our righteousness. Amen. Now lift up your heads and square your shoulders and listen to these words from Peter uh, coming from the book of Acts chapter 10. And again, as I read, listen May that that last sentence land on us with appropriate weight, beautiful weight. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, 
All the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And some of you just need to hear that again, that last sentence, and ask the Lord to help you believe it and to appropriate it. To him, that is to Jesus, all of the prophet, prophets bear witness that everyone, that includes you, Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Friends, that is amazingly good news. And that is why we gather to celebrate this good news. So please, again, I ask you if you're able to stand wherever you are. And let's sing a song of gratitude. His mercy is more. having confessed our sins and that assurance of pardon and singing this song, I just want to have us briefly dwell on that chorus again. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, aren't they? They are many, but his mercy is more. It's stronger and it's mightier. Praise the Lord. 
And we now have the opportunity, uh, having peace with God the Father through Christ the Son and his work on the cross, uh, to extend that peace, to share it with one another. It's imperfect, of course, because we're in this space here and there's people outside, uh, people watching uh, online as well. So we'll do the best that we can. But I will extend peace to you and I would ask that you uh, would extend the peace of Jesus to me as well. And then uh, immediately to your neighbors, uh, do that again and uh, Bill will unmute uh, the people online and we'll be able to include them as well. In fact, we may take just a, a, a bit of an extra time more than normal uh, for a couple of us, maybe Mitch and I to say hello, maybe we just peek our heads out the windows now that they're actually literally open uh, to extend that piece as well. So feel free doing that, just don't scare them. All right, a little complicated, but I think we can do it. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And also with you. Peace be with you. So with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Miles. Yeah. Jonathan. Uh, who perhaps are joining us for the first time, uh, especially we welcome you. And if it's been a while since a number of you have indeed joined us, uh, we are, as a reminder, going through the Psalms uh, this summer as we have been doing for quite some time. So we're just going in order. And this morning, uh, we are uh, going to be covering Psalm 92, uh, which is uh, I'd ask you to look in your Bible for that, or you could look on screen as well. And I'd ask that you please follow along as I read God's word. Psalm 92. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know, the fool cannot understand this, that Though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Let's pray. Father, to you belong all wisdom, honor, glory, power, love, and praise. Speak to us now through your holy word, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
I want you to imagine that you had some sort of a, a joy machine. I, I tried to come up with a name, I just couldn't come up with it, so it's joy machine. Uh, that sort of, think of it this way, when you're low on happiness and joy, that you can just think of something and the needle sort of moves toward increasing your joy, okay? So get that picture in your mind, whatever that might look like, however it's worked out. So here's the question. What puts an extra step in your joy meter? What is that one thing, that one thing above anything else that you turn to? Maybe it's just instinctually to increase your joy. Especially when the world all around us, maybe even your life, right? I mean, most of us would have to admit, joy is it, it's at a premium right now. What makes you happy? So happy, so full of joy that it notably spills over in your life. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about joy, specifically how to cultivate and sustain it in your life. I've titled this sermon, Gladness and God's Greatness. Gladness and God's Greatness. And as we consider Psalm 92... Uh, we'll especially consider three things. First, tireless praise. Second, heedless arrogance. And finally, endless vitality. Now, before we get into the first point, a very brief word about the psalm's title, which if you've noticed, it just says a song for the Sabbath. In fact, it's a bit redundant. A psalm, which means a song, and then a song for the Sabbath. Now, why was it given this title, which itself also is considered scripture? Well, admittedly, I have to say the answer isn't too clear. Whether it means uh, the literal Sabbath rest uh, from God's creation or maybe a Sabbath rest for the people of God, no one really knows. But it does leave plenty of room for various imaginative possibilities. All right, on to the first point, and that's tireless praise. Look with me at verses 1 through 4. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the works of your hands I sing for joy. I mean, obviously, it's, it's right to give thanks uh, and praise to the Lord simply for who he is and what he has done and is doing and will do. And in the context of understanding the Sabbath as ceasing from the six days of work and creation even more so. But it's, it's more than simply right, isn't it? The psalmist says it's good. Good in what way? Really, it's, it's all senses of the word. It fits the situation. It's right in and of itself. And even feeling good. Yes, I just said that. All three senses of the word, including how we feel. Not only because we're reflecting on God's steadfast love and faithfulness, but also note for what it does to and for us. It makes us glad. Why and how? By looking up in the Lord and thinking and reflecting on what he has done. Look with me at verse 4. For you, O Lord, have made me glad. How? By your work. And then he repeats it. At the works of your hand, I sing for joy. He sort of inverts the first part of that verse. So the question is, what's the work that the psalmist is referring to? Well, that might be the work of creation, hence that title, A Song for the Sabbath, looking at what he's made, right? So we look up at the heavens, we marvel at the stars, planets, galaxies, or you could ponder the seas, not only how deep and powerful they are, but what they contain. And you look at everything on the ground, from great mammals to the smallest insects. And of course, we can look at people, we can look at one another, even those of us in this room or outside, or if you're with somebody watching, on Zoom. I mean, just think for a moment how incredibly different we are. 
not just in personality, but also in language, culture, appearance, music, art, food. In these and in so many other ways, the psalmist is encouraging us to consider and reflect on God's creation, marvel and wonder at God's hands, not his literal hands, that's an, what's called an anthrop anthropomorphism, sort of attributing uh, a human physical aspects to God, okay? But marvel and wonder at his hands producing it and then praising him because of it. But a second way that works might be used here in Psalm 92 is the work of salvation. You can see this from verses 2 and 3. To declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. And the Psalms are filled with this notion of declaring God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And so it's perfectly reasonable that the works here in Psalm 92 refer to God's saving acts demonstrating his love and his faithfulness to us. One can see this even in the very way that the Lord is referenced in the first stanza, right? If you look there, Lord, the uppercase, sort of uh, smaller uppercase uh, L-O-R-D, meaning Yahweh, which emphasizes the Lord's covenant love for his people, that he always will be our God and we, his people, no matter what. We can depend on that. We can, we can bank on it. Okay, so that's the why. Because we reflect on the works of his hands, perhaps in creation or salvation, and maybe it's both. So how does it happen? Well, I've mentioned part of it already. It's by speaking. We declare on the Lord's steadfast love and his faithfulness, but note the duration. It's not just in the morning or confined to a Sunday morning worship service such as this, or in the evening, rather than to be confined to a specific part of the day, this is praise that is ongoing. And, and it's just, there's a totality that encompasses the whole day, every single part of it. Well, maybe you're wondering, well, does this mean that the psalmist is encur encouraging sort of a a worldly detachment so we can exclusively praise God 24-7? Well, of course not. Instead, it encourages us to think, to so think on the Lord's works throughout all hours of the day in various ways that it, that it spills over not only into sporadic outbursts or dis displays of, dis of declaring God's praise. The second way we praise God, the how is for his mighty works is by singing. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name. How? To the music of the lute and the harp, the melody of the lyre. And this inclusion of instrumentation is why many commentators suggest that Psalm 92 is indeed a song for the Sabbath. Of course, Lutes, harps, lyres were the instruments of the day uh, when Psalm 92 was written. And today we praise God on Sunday mornings, incorporating a variety of musical styles. Some churches indeed still use lutes and harps. Others get electric guitar and drums. And there's, of course, in that spectrum, everything in between. Here's the point regarding instrumentation. It's not that the psalmist is prescribing or preferring one style over another. Rather that he's rightly recognizing that musical instruments aid the human voice in singing praise to God, right? It's not an either or, it is in this psalm and in others, it's a both and. Some admittedly are more skilled in praising God with the human voice. So we have choirs, others with instruments, uh, sometimes separately, often together. Together, that is, singing and making melody to the Lord for his mighty works. Now, lest you think that it's merely good and right to praise God for his mighty acts as, let's say, the ultimate end. 
Note what effect God's works have on the psalmist in verse 4. I've already mentioned it before. You, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. In other words, it's not enough for us to marvel at God's handiwork. They even produce gladness and joy. And, and sometimes in our circles, ones that so emphasize right knowing and thinking above all else are at the expense of everything else, eclipsing everything else, we end up with a very different paraphrase. For you, O Lord, have made me pensive by your work. Hmm. At the works of your hands, I ruminate. I mean, that's part of what we can, hmm, that's very, I'll read, read a few books on that. I find it really interesting. Um, how different, though, are the words of John Calvin? Yes, John Calvin, listen to what he writes, writing on Psalm 92. We are, we <laughs> are the proper objects of his faithfulness and goodness, and it would argue inexcusable indifference if they did not elicit our cordial praise. But not only are we to diligently observe them, he writes that we're to, these, these, are, these are his words, we're to be excited by a holy joy to the celebration of praise. John Calvin, yep. Look it up. He wrote it. Here's the point. We mustn't minimize verse 4. That the, you have made me glad and I will sing for joy. Now some of you may think we need to praise God solely because he's worthy of it, right? Sort of case closed. That's the, the fundamental reason. But the psalmist provides a one another motivator, and it's one that may seem self-serving, but it isn't, and it's to increase our gladness and joy. His basis for gladness and joyfulness, in other words, if you look at verse 4, are verses 1 through 3, the works of his hands. And so we mustn't separate them or view them as two polar opposites that are incompatible. Rather, they go hand in hand in right motivation an expression of praising the Lord. C.S. Lewis uh, famously stumbled over this point, not necessarily in this psalm, but in, in other psalms. He found it difficult to muster up the motivation to praise God until he realized that we often praise all the time, even the most ordinary mundane things and that we don't have to manufacture or fake it. Rather, it comes naturally, and when we just can't help expressing itself, whether it's in, in sports or in art or in love or in certain news that we hear, a whole myriad of things. In other words, there's an inextricable link between praise and enjoyment. Listen to what he writes. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy, because the praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. The Scotch Catechism, that is the Westminster Confession, says that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we shall know then that these things are the same thing. Fully to enjoy is to glorify. And in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. Which is why John Piper sort of turned that on its head. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. They're not separate, they're linked inextricably together. In other words, what is Lewis saying? What's Psalm 92 saying? that if you would have a life marked uh, by joy and gladness, I dare say a, a happy life in the deepest sense of that word, that it begins with looking, looking at God and his mighty works, both in creation and salvation, and then to become so intellectually and even emotionally 
our whole selves affected by these works, that they spill over into wonder and praise, both in words, what we say, what we declare, and in song. All right. I said there were three points. First point is much longer than the other two, so don't be too concerned. But on to the second point. Heedless arrogance, verse, verses 5 through 9. Look with me there. If the person in verses 1 through 4 has the sense that it's good and right to praise God, even making him glad, note the opposite. Look at verse 6. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. Well, he's not referring to someone's mental or intellectual aptitude or capacity that maybe you have bad grades or you get low scores on an IQ test. Rather, this is someone who refuses to look to God and consider his mighty acts. And his reputed refusal to do so only shows how foolishly stupid he is. Indeed, many people considered having top-right intellects are, spiritually speaking, got to make that very clear, this is from a spiritual perspective. You might have lots of initials behind your name and lots of academic pedigree. You may have written many academic scholarly journal articles and published top-rate books. But they are stupid fools if they don't consider God as the one who made everything. Now, would I ever tell someone that in so many words? Mm-hmm. No. I mean, not unless I had a relationship there they'd be able to receive the words in love and not as an insult or an accusation, and nor, I'm sure, would you. But here, that's precisely what the psalmist does. Calling those who don't ponder and praise God for his mighty works as stupid fools. But it only gets worse. For these people aren't only spiritually stupid. What else does he say? That they're considered God's very enemies, doomed to destruction forever, in verse 7. And this isn't because God arbitrarily dooms them. I'm saving you, I'm dooming you. It's because, in the truest sense of the word, these people are indeed his enemies. Look with me at verse 9. Behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. We've all heard, haven't we? We maybe even have said it. I know I have before. The old adage, hate the sin, love the sinner. But that has no place in God's economy. Those who stubbornly remain in their spiritual ignorance will ultimately get what they want, which is complete and total and eternal separation from and destruction by the God who made them and all things to glorify and enjoy him more than anything and anyone else. If the end result of God's enemies is that they're scattered and doomed to destruction, note the stark contrast compared with the one who praises and enjoys God. This brings us to our third and final point, endless vitality. Endless vitality. Look with me at verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They're planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They're ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. Why palm trees, right? They're not native to Minnesota. I haven't seen one for quite some time. Well, the psalmist is emphasizing how straight and erect they are. That's what he's doing by by incorporating palm tree. Cedar tree from Lebanon, that suggests something very different. That suggests strength. So I want you to picture a straight and strong tree. Kids, if you're watching from home, just you can stand up just where you are and pretend you're a straight, strong tree. 
All right, just like I did. Pretend you're a straight and strong tree, one that's flourishing. It's green and it's lush. It's fruitful. And why is that? Because of verse 13. They are planted in the house of the Lord. And that little part of the verse there is better translated as being transplanted. They've been transplanted in the house of the Lord by God himself. In the house of the Lord, in the courts of, the, of God. And this is not just a temporary flourishing. It's not like, in other words, he's contrasting the, with the evildoers in the previous verses that sprout up like, sprout quickly like grass. This is a type of flourishing with mileage. Verse 14. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. And this imagery echoes Psalm 1, which is the gateway to the rest of the Psalter, where he writes, he's like a tree planted by streams of water. One wonders if this imagery was on the Apostle Paul's mind when he would later write in Colossians 1.13 that he, and he's referring to Jesus, Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the sort of transplanting, the sort of transfer going on in Psalm 92. And I think the, that was in the Apostle Paul's mind as he wrote this years later. It says, if the psalmist is very practically be putting before us a picture at, at heart of two types of people, and he's forcing us to look at them, and he's asking us to consider, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? Kids, you get asked all the time, what do you want to be when you grow up? <clears throat> Adults, we don't hear that as much. You already are what you're going to be. Some of you still aren't, but it's a great question to ask for everybody. What do you want to be when you grow up? Assuming that you lived, God grants you a long life. Let's say he gives you 80 years, roughly, in that time frame, give or take 10, 15. Okay, let's say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you want to be spiritually stupid? I mean, in other words, refusing to look to and acknowledge the Lord as the maker and sustainer of all things, then you can expect his judgment. But the one who acknowledges and joyfully praises him, how different the result. Because there's not only permanence, spiritually speaking, but there, it's life-giving, full of sap and green, even in old age. Do you, have you ever met some old people who are so crotchety and cranky that you wonder, how did you end up this way? Some of them are Christians. Now, we've got to be careful not to be too reductionistic here. Many things may have happened. Things could have happened. Uh, mental faculties diminished. Bodily ailments. Other things contributing to that. So I want to be very careful not to collapse it and reduce it and to make it so simplistic. The reasons might be varied and complicated, but... The point is, is for us not to overlook the benefits of Psalm 92 in old age. On the other hand, don't you want to be that person, right? I said, have you met those people who are cranky and crotchety, sort of ornery? Do you know those people that are just warm, loving, they're just listening. They're full of grace and mercy. That's the sap. They're lush and they're green. Many of them, even amid the frailties and limitations that come with old age. If you want to be, in other words, that sort of person, as opposed to this other person, then give thanks to the Lord. 
Give thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to his name. Declare, talk of, speak of his steadfast love in the morning and his faithfulness by night. Do that right now. We've been doing that this morning together. While, in other words, do it while you have life and breath and vigor. While most of us have the youth and energy, do you want joy? Psalm 92 bids us all to come to the Lord, look at him, to behold his works, and to praise him for his mighty acts, which means knowing him as he's revealed himself in his word, and then being so moved by his covenant and steadfast love shown to us in Jesus, that it produces joy, a lasting joy in our lives. Joy that's not temporary, it's lasting, it's eternal, it's strong, and it's residing and abiding in the presence, sustained by the Lord forever and ever and ever. Now, some of you listening don't consider yourself a Christian, and so I want to thank you at this late in the sermon that you have not completely tuned out, thinking I've called you a stupid fool. And many of you perhaps uh, have little to no interest in becoming a Christian, but I, I simply ask you to reconsider. Using Psalm 92 as a springboard, I encourage you to think on the mighty acts of creation. Open yourself up. Just open yourself up to the possibility, the sheer possibility, no matter how small, that maybe, just maybe, there is a God behind it all. And, and a God who didn't merely make the world, detach himself from it, but a God who so identified with it, especially with humanity made it his image, that he entered into it. He jumped right in, even though we've marred and mucked it up with our sinful rebellion. He didn't give up. He didn't give up on us. By sending his son, Jesus, into the world to become one of us, fully God, fully God, fully man, to redeem us from our sin and ourselves, not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. He loves you. Would that we'd receive his steadfast love, not as punishment. Would that you'd experience, really experience his unchanging faithfulness, that his word and his promises are true. And that despite a ruthless world and our fickle selves, he is absolutely unchanging. And so we're not only to praise him, but to enjoy him, not just now, but forever and ever and ever. Just open yourself up. I just ask that, open yourself up to the possibility that this God, this God, really exists. This isn't a God drawn from false characters or from your own imagination. It's one from Psalm 92 and indeed the rest of the pages of Scripture. And know that he's willing to extend his mercy and forgiveness even to you. Yes, to you today. And in Jesus, as we read about earlier during our confession of sin, to him bear, all the, all the prophets bear witness that everyone, everyone, no exceptions, who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Think on that today. Pray on that. Look to Psalm 92. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We declare your works and sing to you. Make us glad by your great works both in creation and salvation, and so cause us to flourish. Even amid hard times as we are now in, may we be strong like those strong and fruitful trees, trees that can withstand pummeling winds. And if you will, that when we walk, we are of riper years, that we be so full 
of life in Jesus, dripping full of sap and fruit and green, that we'd be life-giving to everyone around us. Give us spiritual eyes to see the beautiful correlation between praising you and increasing our and others' joy. We especially thank you for Jesus, who lived and died for us and rose again, and now sits at your right hand, interceding for us. For it's in his mighty and glorious name that we ask these things. Amen. Good morning. Um, my name is Mitch Wellborn, and um, I'm happy to lead us in the uh, second portion, uh, second half of our worship this morning. And uh, as we transition into uh, our response of faith, um, hearing from the Lord, uh, and then responding back to the Lord in appropriate ways, um, we are um, brought to a question about Sabbath worship. Um, I think Sabbath worship is a, um, a great topic to meditate on, but I would just, uh, thinking of this question as we're talking about our confession of faith, we're about to confess what we believe to be true, and that confession uh, usually takes the form of, um, you know, uh, creeds from the past, things that we believe as a church, um, and asking ourselves, uh, you know, very practically, why would we get up early get dressed. Some of us in our PJs go to uh, a building or to our living room. Really, uh, not just a church service, but why would we devote uh, a day of the week to something that we might not want to do? Indeed, it's a discipline. It's a commandment. It's a requirement. And it's also something that's really hard to do. Well, it's because we believe that worship is vital to our souls. In fact, Psalm 92 speaks of this, that the Sabbath is not only a commandment, but it's good. Psalm 92 shows us what the rhythms of worship produce within a believer's heart. As we establish these patterns, might we be like the psalmist says, that in our old age, we would bear fruit. And so with that in mind, let us confess our faith using uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 116. Brothers and sisters, what do you say? What does the fourth commandment require of us? The fourth commandment requires all men to sanctify or set apart to God the times he has established in his word and especially one whole day out of every seven. This was the seventh day from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ and the first day of the week ever since. It will come that way until the end of the world. This is the Christian Sabbath in the New Testament called the Lord's Day. Amen. Well, now we continue to worship as we um, bring our money. Some of you have already brought money. Uh, it's not just money. It's that which money can symbolize. And that is the ability to own and operate our own existence. Indeed, if you've ever been without money, it's really hard to consider that you have very few options. And if you remember as a kid when you got your allowance or you got a paycheck for the first time, the possibilities that you had when you had something with which to spend, you had money to burn. And so money is that which can free us from dependence or cause us to be more dependent. And in this case, 
what I'd like to, you to consider is how can your giving drive you to a place where you are more dependent on the one who has gifted you and blessed you with all that you have. Now I'm aware that, um, and thankful that um, you all are giving online. We're going to continue to do that and trust that the Lord will provide for us as he has and will continue to do. And so you'll see links for our giving on our, on our website and within our newsletter. Uh, I also just think that it's really important to continue to remind ourselves of what giving is and what it does within our hearts and that it changes us. It helps us give over control back to the Lord where it's so easy to take that control with our paychecks. Now we get to um, join together in prayer, sometimes corporately. Uh, lately it has been um, corporately, but sometimes it's individual prayer, um, pastoral prayer, singing. Uh, today what we're going to do is I'm going to pray and what we're going to do is we're going to pray for our graduates. Um, it is the beginning slash middle of July, um, but we do want to remember our graduates as they are preparing uh, for either online classes in the fall um, or entering into the workforce, looking for jobs, um, whatever it may be, moving off to college. Uh, we know that this is a big step. This is something that we want to join with you and commission you in some ways um, to go out into the world as uh, you do move away from uh, here or move on to the next stage in life. And so if you would, uh, let's pray together for these graduates. Um, the names won't be up on the screen here, but they're in our bulletin and they'll be uh, available, but I'll read them off for you here. Um, our high school graduates are Josie Donaldson, Noah Johnson, David Jones, and Isaac Jones. And our college graduates are Mackenzie Harper and Esther Young. Let's pray for these uh, individuals uh, right now. Lord, we come to you and pray for our graduates. We reflect on this rite of passage. Lord, we, th we are thankful, proud, delighted, relieved, and yet more than a little excited for them as they enter into this new stage of life. Along with these emotions also comes a sense of apprehension for the future. Lord, we're eagerly awaiting to see what you're going to do in and through their lives. You, however, have never feared and don't fear because you are our sovereign God. Your mercy and love will follow these young people where we are not able to go. You have been and will continue to be our covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. You have these young people, our children, our friends, our sisters and brothers, daughters, sons, and you know the plans that you have for them. We pray that their minds and hearts would be open to God's truth. We pray that you would create within them a desire for worship, a passion for the living God. We pray that they would not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of their minds. God, would you bring students, friends, teachers who would point them to Christ along their path? Would you direct their energies so they might be a blessing to others? We pray that they would build relationships with coworkers that are uh, glorifying with other students that are pleasing to you, Lord, and that they would seek your will when facing temptation. All we can do, Father, is pray that your hand would be with them to lead them and guide them when we, when we cannot. And as they go to college and venture out into the world, into the workforce, we as a church do send them out with this blessing. God bless you and keep you. God make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And God look on favor with you and grant you peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, at this time, we circle outside. We form a circle outside. I was going to say circle up. 
Um, we form a circle outside to do our doxology. So if you've got things in here, if you've got small children, don't feel the stress of having to gather all of that. You can come back for it, but let's stand. We'll go outside. We'll circle uh, around the, um, the lawn area and the sidewalk here, and we'll sing our doxology and then have our commission and benediction. If you're on Zoom, please stay with us. We'll be back shortly um, to, you'll, you'll join us shortly back out there. <laughs> Are you ready to swap spot button here? Yeah. I'm about to go. Ready? Maybe my key's off. Maybe not. Here we go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly. Uh, which is timely, uh, given where we are, just in the world, in our cities, and with what we preached on in Psalm 92. From uh, Romans 15, may the God of hope, may the God fill each and every one of you with all joy and peace in believing, so no, 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 no. that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank mm -hmm. you. 